Lawrence and our, uh, our residential energy storage technology uh, panel discussion here. It's a panel is a little bit of a new thing for us, so we'll see how this goes. But I think we've uh, we've got some pretty heavy hitters up here, as you'll see, and uh, we're going to talk briefly about each of these uh, battery technologies. So um, what I'm going to do is introduce each of these gentlemen in turn and let them uh, say a few words about the particular battery technology or technologies that they're uh, uh, representing today, and uh, then we'll we'll kind of go through talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, applications and things uh, for each type. So uh, at the end of that, if we can get through this quickly, then we'll, we'll hope to have some time for audience questions. Uh, so I'll come out in the audience, pass you the microphone, and, and uh, uh, we'll uh, you know, have hopefully a little time for that. So uh, let's start with, uh, with uh, Harvey Wilkinson. So Harvey's the uh, general manager uh, for Outback Power. I uh, hope I got that right. <laughs> um, Harvey, you've been in the industry for quite a while, seen a lot of innovation uh, not only with you know sort of the tech, the products Outback sells, but also with your A one two three before uh, doing a lot of you know very high level work with uh, other chemistries as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know the the new nanocarbon batteries that Outback's launching, uh, and what makes them different from the uh, the standard you know lead acid batteries? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Good. Well, number one, the chemistry is different. Um, and let me give you sort of the quick um, chemistry, chemical uh, difference, and then I'll go into the, what it means to you. Uh, the enhanced negative action material formulation, specifically barium sulfate, is on a nanoscale, which provides more nucleation sites on the negative electrode of the battery, okay? So what does that mean, right? So essentially what it means is you have the positive electrode, the negative electrode, we've enhanced the negative electrode, and you have the electrolyte. All three of them will deteriorate over time, but with enhanced negative electrode, you can affect um, the deterioration of the overall batteries. And specifically, it gives you two things. Number one is your round trip efficiency is it's much more efficient. And because the nanocarbon particles in the negative electrode, your charge discharge is much more efficient to the rate of about 95%, which is much higher than a typical lead acid battery is. And what that means is you can exchange energy much more efficiently and it also means you're not heating up your battery as much because you have a more efficient reaction. The second thing is it cycles much better at partial state of charge. So it has almost 50% greater state of charge cycling at partial state of charge. And typical AGM, you really do need to top off your battery on a regular basis or you're going to kill your battery. And in this case, you do not need to. As a matter of fact, we recommend maybe every 50 cycles or so you, you go ahead and top it off. Um, Every time you top off any technology, any chemistry, you're affecting the life of it. Batteries don't like to be discharged all the way down. They don't like to be charged all the way up. And by operating in that partial state of char charge area, um, you get more, you're, A, you're more efficient. B, you get more cycles out of it. It's better for the battery from that standpoint. The other thing is it, pro it more mirrors a typical PV insulation where you're not going to be charging it you know, all the time. You're not going to be discharging it all the time. You'll probably operate that partial state of charge um, regiment most of the time, whether you're off grid, except for the fact if you're grid connected battery, you know, if you're grid connected with simply battery backup, anytime you're using your energy storage, chance are you're going to be using it in a cycling kind of application. With the exception of that, everything else is the same size, weight, terminals, um, you know, maintenance free kind of batteries and fits in the same cabinets as a normal AGM battery. But the two big differences are efficiency and your cycle life. Great, thanks, Harvey. Um, so Nishant Sharma is uh, director of sales for Aquian, uh, which is uh, you know a new battery technology. This is uh, a sodium ion battery. Uh, I've personally been following the sodium ion batteries for quite some time. I think uh, Aquian is, however, the first company to make it real. Um, so can you uh, maybe just take a couple minutes and explain what what is the sodium ion chemistry and what are the you know what makes this battery work? Uh, because it's, again, very, very new. Right. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction there. Um, so Aquion Energy is uh, a six-year-old company. It actually spun out of uh, Carnegie Mellon University um, in 2009, 2010. Uh, for the initial years, um, you know, we did a lot of uh, testing validation because uh, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to create a new chemistry, validate it, make sure it works. Um, so we did that for four years, doing field trials, demos, uh, proving that technology works, and then um, uh, we started selling commercially about two years ago. 
So what's inside the battery? Um, first off, it's not a lithium ion battery. It's not a lead acid battery. It's not a flow battery. Um, it's, uh, we've, it's a new kind of technology, and it's, uh, it's called aqueous hybrid ion, uh, AHI. Uh, and that aqueous, uh, what that means, it's water-based technology. So we use sodium sulfate um, as the uh, electrolyte. So it's basically salty salt water. Um, you can actually drink it. It doesn't taste good, but um, um, so, so, so that's the electrolyte as uh, opposed to um, some of the organic or inorganic compounds that you see in lithium ion batteries or sulfuric acid that you see in lead acid batteries. So it's a water-based uh, electrolyte. The, uh, the, the, the cathode and the anode, as Harvey mentioned, the positive and the negative, uh, electrodes are very similar to what you see in lead acid. It's carp, the graphite, um, and, then, um, and then we have a proprietary um, anode as well. Um, the, the separators that we use uh, is cotton, so stuff that you wear uh, in your t-shirt. Um, so synthetic cotton is actually used as a separator. Um, so when you, think of, when you think about the overall composition, there's nothing toxic in the battery. It's basically salt water, dirt, rocks, cotton, um, and that's what's inside the batteries. Um, so made from pretty benign, abundantly available materials. I know there was a lot of discussion early about lithium you know, being obsolete or you know, scarce uh, in certain parts in Bolivia and certain regions. So everything that we get is like abundantly available. It's safe. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like you could technically eat everything that's inside the battery. Um, oh, we are UL listed. Um, and uh, and it, the, the technology is actually designed for energy applications. So it's a little bit different than power applications where you do like backup or UPS, uh, fast charge, fast discharge. Um, more, um, our technology is more on the energy side, which means it's low charge, slow discharge, um, you know, and we'll talk about, I think, applications later on. Um, but a couple of advantages uh, of the technology, other than the fact that it's green and, um, you know, it's, we are, um, uh, you know, so a lot of battery technologies are very temperature dependent, uh, which means that most battery technologies are characterized at 23 degrees Celsius, uh, which means that if you deviate from ambient temperature, uh, you see significant drop off in capacity, or if you increase temperature, you see a significant drop off in, uh, in cycle life. Uh, our batteries are actually tested at 30 degrees Celsius, uh, which is a hot environment. And, uh, and we see no degradation in cycle life at 30 degrees Celsius, at 40 degrees Celsius. So majority of our installations don't require air conditioning or H, uh, HVAC systems or even fire suppression. Like we don't have any uh, flammable characteristics, um, uh, you, know, which are, uh, you know, which are there in some of the other uh, battery technologies. So, uh, and in terms of cycle life, uh, we're at about 3,000 cycles at 100% DOD. Um, technically, you can use the, the full capacity that's inside the battery, but as Harvey mentioned, generally, like for daily use, daily cycling, we'd recommend 80%, 90% depth of discharge. Um, so that's, um, in a nutshell, um, an overview of uh, Aquion. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Stephen Pollock is uh, Director of Sales for uh, the Tesla's Powerwall product, and uh, I think that, you know, probably more than any other uh, is the battery that most of you know your customers are probably asking about because it's you know got a lot of press, uh, a lot of things have been said about it, um, you know, sensational and otherwise. Uh, but can you take a minute, uh, Stephen, just kind of set the record straight on you know what is the power wall, uh, you know what's it what's it designed to do, and uh, just kind of take it from there. Thanks. Sure. Um, thank you for uh, for having us. Uh, so one, one small clarification on, the, on my role. So I focus on uh, North America business development and sales, behind the meter um, sales. And that's more on the product side and the partners that we work with. And we're all very, also very focused on customer experience. So I also manage uh, the global power wall channel strategy. And we're trying to have that Tesla customer experience, that white glove feel uh, consistently uh, executed across the globe. So it's very important to us. And that leads us to what our product does. So it's not just about the product. It's about the entire experience from setting expectations to transportation to how you sell it, how you install it, how you operate it over time. Um, this comes from a world where we, we live in a vertically integrated um, car manufacturing world. That's where we come from. So we're used to being able to control all of those levers at the same time and make sure that no matter what we say and what we do, 
that the customer has a positive experience, even if it, if, if it means uh, learning lessons and coming back and supporting the customer over time. Um, so if I get to the product and how that fits into that, we essentially have two products, and there has been a little bit of confusion around what those two products are. One is a 6.4 kilowatt hour daily cycle lithium ion battery. Uh, it's wall mounted, you can, mount, uh, you can install it indoors or outdoors. It's very flexible, it's out of the way, it looks good. A lot of people want to install it in a garage next to a, 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 a hopefully a Model S or Model X. Um, but that, that product is really intended for um, a variety of applications where you would be using the battery discharging and charging on a daily basis. Uh, self-consumption, possibly self-consumption with some backup, with grid services, it's very flexible. Um, in setting expectations, we really talk about 100% depth of discharge. Uh, we think there's a lot of confusion around that. So we net that depth, depth of discharge out. So when people hear 6.4 kilowatt hours, they're really getting 6.4 kilowatt hours, that they can fully cycle um, zero to 100% every day. The other product is the weekly cycle. So it's, it's, when we talk about cell chemistries, we test thousands and thousands and thousands of cell chemistries. We had all of this experience from the car side of the business where we're driving cars in very, uh, a very broad set of operating environments. So we know how to operate in very cold environments. We know how to operate in very hot environments. Um, so when we talk about the weekly cycle, it's a different cell chemistry that's focused on only discharging once a week. Because it's a different cell chemistry and it has limited um, discharge and charge cycles per year, we can get more energy density. So for a backup application or some sort of demand response programs where you're only gonna uh, do a, occasional charge and discharge, it's really more suited for that. Uh, and we actually see a lot more globally, a lot more demand for self-consumption and the, uh, the daily cycle battery. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, Blair Reynolds is uh, product manager for Enphase's uh, energy storage product line. And um, I think most people have heard from uh, the InterSolar and SPI, you know, Enphase is working on an AC battery. Uh, seems a little counterintuitive to those of us who've been doing batteries for a long time or like, what, what do you mean AC battery? Um, so can you take a minute and you know, maybe in a nutshell explain you know, what is that concept and, uh, and why would you use it? Sure. So at Enphase, <clears throat> we focus on maximizing the integration of components in order to create the quickest and simplest installation possible. And we do that on a common AC architecture. So take our microinverter, for example. By eliminating the DC string, uh, we've created the safest, the simplest to design, and the simplest to install solution on the market. And much in that same vein, the AC battery is the safest and simplest way to integrate a battery with a PV system. So instead of taking an off-the-shelf inverter and figuring out how to marry it with a battery, we've done that work for you, thereby eliminating the design complexity. And you know, if Nikola Tesla were in the room today, I think he would really gravitate towards our solution because <laughs> we have a sim similar vision for the world, an AC world. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so let's move on. Uh, Go ahead and talk about some of maybe the, uh, you know, what's going on with the next level of, you know, peel the onion back a bit. So, Harvey, you've been, you know, part of a lot of innovation in the battery space. Um, and, you know, we're seeing now, obviously, all these new technologies coming out, uh, you know, nanocarbon aside. I mean, what, what do you think is going to happen with, with lead acid batteries and even, you know, the advanced forms of them as all of these new battery technologies start getting traction in the marketplace? From an energy storage standpoint, you know, it's sort of like the, this is sort of the, the final frontier that we need it to uh, to get to in order to make PV and a lot of other stuff, the renewables, uh, really successful. I, so I think it's really exciting we've done that. And you're right, I've, I've done flywheels, ultra caps, lithium metal polymer, lithium ion. I've done a lot of different energy storage technologies. And the biggest um, thing that we that I saw was that we it, it doesn't happen as quickly as we think it's going to happen. And I go back to the fiber optic. I was in the 80s. I was also with fiber optic cable. And originally, fiber optic cable came out, and copper and coax was gone. Was was away. It was it was gone. Matter of fact, we sold the copper plant, saying this copper won't survive. And today, copper cable and coax is still as strong. Although fiber is used a whole lot more than it ever was used in the 80s. So. I see sort of a similar um, way of doing it. Initially, advanced technologies like 
you know, nickel metal hydride used to be HEV vehicles. Right now, you only use lithium ion. You wouldn't think of an EV without a lithium ion battery because it's light, it's dense, it's you know, it cycles well, and all that kind of stuff. So, similar way, I see that you know, uh, you know, we're moving toward the advanced technologies. But just like flow batteries do well in the utility space, and and uh, lithium batteries do well certainly in the motive space. You know, lead acid batteries have been around for 150 years, and, and especially with the advanced lead acid batteries, they're going to be around for a long time in the future as well because they're available, they're economical, there's a lot of competition, they're recyclable because the infrastructure's in place, uh, they're, they're safe. Um, for all the reasons that people use them, I think they're going to continue to use them. I think more and more the way it's going to happen is as the niches become better defined and as people look at them, then they're going to start using them. I will tell you, we have our customers that are using you know, lithium, they, but the fun thing is they use nickel iron as well. So they're using some old technologies, they use some new technologies. I think it depends on what your application is, what makes sense for the given application. I think over time, you're going to see more and more of the advanced chemistries being used. My recommendation to everybody is, when you buy your inverter, buy your inverter that can take care of the current technologies and also work with the advanced technologies because if, if you're not going to, if you're buying lead acid now, which I think in a lot of ways makes sense economically or whatever, in the future, you're likely get, you know, at some stage in your PV system's life to have some kind of advanced technology as well as with that. Right, thank you. Um, so, uh, Nishant, I, I think a battery you can eat probably wins the environmental cred hands down. <laughs> Um, how do, I mean, how do the Aquian batteries stack up in terms of, of performance? Right. So, um, so in terms of performance, um, so like I mentioned earlier, we're um, an energy battery. So we're not a power battery, which means that we like to be discharged over several hours, several days. Um, you know, in some cases, even providing two, three days, two, two to three days of autonomy when there's no sun. Um, so, um, so having said that, when you look at the performance, in terms of cycle life, we're pretty even with where lithium ion is today uh, in terms of cycle life. Um, we have uh, very good performance in terms of temperature. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all our batteries are characterized um, at 30 degrees Celsius. Um, so in, I would say about 95% of our installations don't require um, HVAC systems um, or any kind of a temperature control unless you're going to Alaska or some really cold climates. Um, and we maintain similar cycle life um, at higher temperatures and lower temperatures. Um, um, the, the batteries, the, you know, the green aspect, we are classified as non-hazardous goods, um, which means that, um, you know, you don't need those hazmat class 9 classification certification to handle ship batteries. Um, our batteries can be shipped air. Um, I know, like, lithium, you know, with lithium ion, you know, some of the airlines are banning hoverboards and you can't even take a second lithium ion battery pack in your luggage. Um, our batteries that can actually fly air um, because of that uh, classification. Um, and, um, and, and for that same reason, uh, we don't actually have any recycling requirements. Um, batteries can be disposed as ordinary trash. Um, so, uh, so, th so that's another advantage, uh, you know, when you think about recycling, um, that you don't have to worry about, you know, shipping it back to the manufacturer or, um, or shipping it to some recycling facility. Um, we also don't, uh, we've done uh, partial state of charge testing, uh, what Harvey mentioned earlier, um, you know, which is also not an issue with our batteries. Um, Sandia Labs did testing, we've demonstrated 22,000 cycles. Um, at 10% SOC, uh, cycle, uh, uh, DOD with, with different SOC ranges. Um, so that's another advantage. Um, so, so all in all, I think other than the green aspect, there are performance advantages. Um, as long as you focus on the energy side for long duration discharge, um, I would say, obviously I'm biased, but I think we're the most competitive uh, chemistry uh, when it comes to uh, energy applications. Thank you. Uh, so Stephen, you know, obviously, Powerwall, like we said, lots of press, and I, and I think you rightly focused on that customer experience. Um, you know, given all the claims that are out there and uh, and people's expectations, I mean, you know, how, is the Powerwall going to meet uh, you know the average consumer's expectations once it's installed? Yeah, um, I think absolutely. Uh, the two main areas we focus on are simplicity and safety. So we are experts in batteries in cell chemistry, architecture, system level design, deployment, 
maintenance over time. Uh, you know, Tesla has won the battle. Uh, the home is AC, but we're generating power that's DC off the panels, and we have to be able to handle that. And some people prefer AC applications. Some people prefer DC applications. There are pros and cons to both. So from a simplicity perspective, we are flexible. Uh, we work with multiple inverter vendors that can support multiple architectures, and we think there are different ways for, for people to deploy this product um, based on the use case, based on if there's existing solar, um, based on existing vendors on the, on the site. Um, so we think that's a very simple model, and we're experts in batteries. So we don't want to come from a different world, uh, whether it's a, a, even an adjacent world. In, inverters, for example, uh, would be an adjacent world we're not trying to get necessarily into other spaces uh, where it doesn't make sense. We want to stay focused on batteries and, uh, and making a, a complete battery system. On the safety side of this perspective, oh, and so that simplicity allows us to meet expectations. We partner with technology providers um, to be able to facilitate these use cases. Um, Self-consumption, uh, battery backup, these are all um, close, coordination, uh, close collaborations we have with our inverter partners to make sure that the, the battery and the inverter work seamlessly uh, for those applications. Um, on the safety side, you know, I think it's clear we operate at a 350 to 450 volt range, and there's been a lot of uh, misconception in, in the public about if that's safe or not. So just to clear things up, we, op we have a 48 volt battery system. It's in a fully enclosed or medically sealed um, pod. You cannot touch those batteries. There is no touch danger, so you can't touch terminals like an old lead acid you know, system. You can't, you can't shock yourself. The only time the battery system can be activated is when all of the safety measures are in place, it's fully installed, uh, and it's operating in conjunction with the inverter and gets the signal from the inverter to start charging or discharging. Uh, the reason we talk about 350 to 400 volts is because we have a DC to DC converter. Uh, we believe operating, having an overall system output of 350 to 400 volts uh, makes for a much more efficient and elegant system, and we think that's the, the future of, the, of, of battery storage. Um, so based on all of those things, we, we believe we are setting up the right expectations to work with uh, partners like yourself and others to be able to communicate a value proposition to homeowners and then sell systems and install systems in a very simple way uh, to meet their expectations. Great, thank you. Um, so. Blair, why, why go AC? I mean, what is, what is the sort of AC topology, and, the, and again, the, the very modular nature of, of Enphase's product, what does that get for you that, that you can't get otherwise? Sure, so first of all, by its very nature, being an AC battery, there is no DC outside of the enclosure whatsoever. So it really is the safest and easiest way to install a battery. Um, furthermore, the batteries get wired up to a 20 amp branch circuit, just like a microinverter. So it's extremely fast. One person can hang a battery and wire it up. You don't need heavy equipment or anything like that to get the battery in the house. And extremely modular. The system can grow over time. The AC batteries will communicate seamlessly with the microinverters on the roof through the common um, power line communications envoy system. So you don't have to manage two different types of monitoring platforms in the home. And lastly, uh, it, AC is by far the easiest way to do a retrofit on any existing PV system, AC coupled. Great. Um, so we'll go back to, back to Harvey now and pass the mic back. So, <laughs> um, I expect most people are pretty familiar with, you know, the limitations on, on the lead acid batteries. How much does the nanocarbon technology actually do, uh, to alleviate those limitations? It sort of depends on what your application is. So I'll give you some ideas of where it would help and where it wouldn't help, but you, the one big area, uh, you can get about f almost 50% extra cycle life uh, that you can from an AGM, which is, you know, from 1,800 to 2,700 cycles. So it's lithium-like kind of performance uh, if you use it uh, from that application. If you use it in a standby application where it's just floating, then getting those extra cycles doesn't really do any good, and it wouldn't make any sense from that standpoint. So uh, just sitting there not cycling it wouldn't make any sense. The second thing is it's much more efficient. So if you want to do energy arbitrage or whatever, it would make sense from that standpoint because you have a more efficient charge, discharge, less heating from that standpoint in terms of what's going on. Um, 
In terms of other areas, it, it does allow a little bit faster charge and discharge, like a C over three rate, which is a three hour discharge rate. But in terms of your total amp hour capacity, it's somewhere to an AGM. So the 20 hour rate in an AGM is somewhere to a nanocarbon 20 hour rate. And a three hour rate is similar as well. It's a little bit better, but not that much better. The other thing is, is just in general, um, there are two things to, that kills batteries, other than you know, the operator or whatever, but that's typically what happens. The other thing this allows you is, if you don't charge your batteries up, you're going to kill your batteries over time. So the one thing it does allow you to do is leave it in partial state of charge. And in a lot of cases, you can't control that because you may not have the PV, something may not, not be working right. So it's an insurance policy from that standpoint, which I think is pretty important. But the other thing, there are two parts to battery life, cycle life and calendar life. In a lot of ways, they're pretty much independent of each other in terms of what's going on. So, you, know, you can hear all these great things about cycle life. My recommendation is look at your cycle life requirements and look at your calendar life requirements, keeping in mind that every battery is affected by heat. 65 degrees C is not a good, good ambient temperature for any battery known to man, right? No matter what battery it is. So if you have a hot environment and you're going to wear your batteries out after a couple years because you have a really hot environment, Cycle life is probably not something you're going to really run out of first. So you have to look at, what am I going to run out of first? My cycle life or my calendar life? These batteries do a little bit better in your calendar life, but really the real strength is on the efficiency and the cycle life. So that's what I would recommend in terms of what the difference is in terms of how you use them. But in general, just keep in mind, batteries cycle life, calendar life, no matter what the chemistry is, and you got to look at them both, and they're fairly independent of each other in terms of where it is. And all batteries are affected I mean, like lithium will play at cold temperatures. All batteries are affected, and that's why they, they, they control it to make sure it doesn't happen. But all fat batteries are affected, particularly by hot temperatures, in a negative way. Great. Uh, so, Nishant, you mentioned that the, the Aquian battery is, is an energy battery, uh, not so much a power battery. What does that mean uh, in terms of, say, voltage and current compared to a similarly sized lead acid system, which I think most folks here would would probably understand best. Right, so um, so if you look at our batteries, our, um, they're all 48 volts. That's the, the basic building block that we use uh, is 48 volts. Um, and primarily designed to work with any off-the-shelf inverters. I know you've got Outback Schneider here. So it works pretty well with that. Um, we, on, on large commercial, so most of our residential projects are, um, are 48 volts. Um, we do higher voltage systems, so we can work with higher voltage inverters. You just have to configure in series and, uh, and, and, get in, and parallel to get the capacity that you need. Um, so when you talk about energy you know, applications, we think about six hours or longer of charge discharge. Um, six hours, 10 hours, 15 hours, 20 hours. Um, so that's, that's, that's a good fit. Um, we're not a good fit for power applications you know, where you need uh, power for like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Um, so that's not a good application for us. Um, and uh, so when I, when I think about applications, um, you know, we look at off-grid and microgrid um, as primarily applications, you know, where you're charging the batteries with solar and then you're dispatching in the evening, nighttime hours. Uh, the same concept can also exist for self-consumption uh, where you charge and discharge over um, uh, several hours. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we fit in. Um, if you look at our spec sheet, um, our basic building block, we actually have a, a dummy stack here at the, uh, at the conference, so if you guys want to take a look at it. Uh, that's the 48-volt, the uh, 50 amp hour um, uh, uh, block. And that 50 amp hour is actually usable capacity. Um, and, uh, and so the maximum current you can get is uh, 10 to 12 amps continuous in one stack. Um, and then, depending on what the capacity you need, you can add the battery stacks in parallel to, um, you know, to get the desired whatever size is based on the load profile. Um, so we don't have limitations in terms of series and parallel. You can put up to like 144 um, of our battery stacks. So that's a lot of current. Um, so that influences the size. But um, and we have two different configurations. One is a 50 amp power, 48 volts, and then the other one is a, a 600 amp power. Um, uh, 48 volts, all usable capacity. Great. All right. Um, so, Stephen, I think you you touched on you know the safety as a priority, and I think that's one of the one of the criticisms I've heard in you know in the, in the press certainly, and and some of your uh, you know competitors, uh, not the ones in this room, 
uh, you know, I've said, hey, that's a, that's a lithium ion, cobalt, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and it's like super fire hazardous. Um, you know, how, are, how is Tesla managing that risk and how big is that risk really? Yeah, um, so the risk is, is out there because people are talking about it and they're not educated to the, the actual fire and safety risks. So we have worked uh, in a global fashion, right? Because this, this kind of fire safety and just general safety is important for the car side of the business too. Uh, we have all of the cars deployed uh, globally. We've worked with local agencies, international agencies, um, US fire departments. NFPA is actually doing a, uh, issuing a study which has recently been published uh, to show that uh, all the testing that they did was extremely positive, and this is all publicly available so you can see it. Um, and we're actually helping set some of the standards for how batteries should be um, um, uh, maintained and, and, and kept safe for use. So um, we think it's an education process. Uh, we know we're, set, we're, we're operating at a national level and international level as a manufacturer, and we're going to be working with our partners in local jurisdictions because our partners in local jurisdictions are the ones who have to get past building and safety, have to get past uh, fire. Um, so we know that we need to support them in the field, and that's kind of our back to our holistic approach, uh, collaboration, education. Great. So, um, so Blair, with a with an AC system, I mean, you get the modularity, but it seems like you're you're going to have to rectify and invert essentially twice whenever you charge and discharge the the battery. Uh, isn't that an efficiency hit? I mean, what are you getting for that? So actually, when you actually do the math, um, our overall system efficiency is right on par with our closest lithium ion competitor. And you start by looking at the, both the inversion and the rectification are happening with an in-phase microinverter with a best-in-class efficiency over 97%. Furthermore, we see a tremendous advantage in the format of our battery. It's a smaller format, 1.2 kilowatt hour battery with less series connections than a larger format, higher voltage competitor. So we see a DC round trip efficiency on our batteries over 96%, whereas other others advertise 92. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so maybe, maybe as we kind of come back here, uh, one last question, then we'll open it up for the, uh, for the audience. But um, uh, I think we've covered sort of the applications that you know, each of your batteries are, are good at. Um, you know, if, if you could each identify an application where you'd say, you know what, one of these other guys' batteries is probably gonna be better fit. Um, I think that's always an interesting uh, question. <laughs> yeah. we, oh, we can go ahead and start with you, Blair. So, you know, use, use a different battery for, for backup power. Um, we, when we survey the market, we really think that uh, the, the use case that we, you know, are best at is increasing self-consumption and empowering our consumers to store their PV generation rather than sell it back to the utility at an unfairly low rate. Um, I would say, <clears throat> once again, our battery technology is fairly simple, and uh, you can use it in many use cases, whether it's backup and, or, um, or self-consumption. I think in either case, we really focus on uh, systems that have, can have high energy needs and high power needs, uh, and we're working to increase both of those. Uh, so I guess if, if you wanted to have a very high energy, low power solution, I would say, you know, um, I would say there might be a better solution out there because we're we're um, we're not optimizing for that environment. Yeah. So technically, when you look at any battery chemistry, for that matter, take lithium ion, lead acid. Um, you know, one battery size, like one battery configuration, doesn't fit all size, all applications. Uh, technically, you can use lithium ion even for energy applications, whether they're economical, efficient. I mean, that's a different story. Um, so generally, we've seen. Um, you know, uh, lithium ion focus on a lot of the power applications, um, you know, with uh, short duration, short uh, charge and short discharge. Um, we're more on the energy side. So that which means that we don't do like any UPS uh, backup power. You know, technically we could do it. We have to oversize the batteries because we, we have higher energy uh, to power ratio. Um, so I would stay away from UPS. Um, backup power, um, you know, applications uh, where you need uh, power for a short duration. Uh, that's not a good fit for us. So the application that immediately comes to mind would be like a grid zero application where you're going to basically live off the grid and just pull from the grid whenever you need it uh, and, and, um, and use your all the available energy you get from your PV system. 
because you're going to be operating in a partial state of charge. You're going to be uh, cycling your batteries on a sort of a daily basis, um, off and on during the day, depending upon where it is, but certainly at night. Um, and it, it operates real in that realm, and also, you know, it does well from a cycling standpoint. And the other thing is the economics. I mean, if you're looking at the economics, you're going to want, you know, 20, 30 kilowatt hours worth of energy storage in order to do all that. So, I um, you have to look at how much it's going to cost me, and it always comes down to PV is very affordable. Energy storage tends to be not as affordable as PV, and that's, that's the big rub of, of energy storage in general. I would say application-wise, anytime you need to use your full state of charge from zero to 100 uh, and or you need to just charge it quickly, then I think I'd look at the lithium side or I'd look at the Aquian side. So many things, obviously, EV standpoint, you obviously use the, the lithium kind of battery. Um, anytime you have to do fast energy arbitrage, um, I would think that the lithium battery would make sense. And then if you're going to do longer-term commercial kind of stuff, um, where you have longer stuff, I think the Aquian would probably make sense, would be would my guess as to where things are. Great. Thank you all for being great sports. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start taking some questions from the audience here. We've got about 15 minutes, and I will uh, bring the microphone to you. Uh, so please uh, let us know who you're asking the, the question of, and, uh, and be as clear and concise as you can. Uh, in regard to the aqueous battery, um, you stated that it's basically using salt water. Uh, all the components are readily available. Nothing's hazardous. Nothing is uh, out of the ordinary realm of elements as we know it. My question is, why is it so expensive? <laughs> so we. Um you know, we are a young company, and, uh, you know, as we scale, um, you know, we'll, um, we have a product roadmap uh, to get more competitive. Um, in fact, even today, when you look at, um, it, it, when you look at the composition, just looking at the bill of material cost, we're significantly lower than $200 a kilowatt hour, even today. In today, so we don't have to look at 2020 um, um, to, to get to $200 a kilowatt hour or or 150, for even for that matter. Um, for us, it's a matter of scale and volume. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, we've been operational. We've been selling commercially for two years. Um, so as we ramp up, you're going to see significant cost reductions, um, you know, coming forward. Um, and uh, and again, like uh, you know, we are a rate dependent chemistry, so our efficiency is impacted based on how you charge and discharge. Um, but if you're looking at longer duration discharge, uh, like six hours, eight hours, 10 hours plus, I mean, we will probably be just about as competitive as lead acid batteries, uh, even like with today's prices. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in business today if we're not competitive. So. Um, this is for uh, Tesla. On the uh, power wall, I know that uh, with lithium ion, you have the battery management systems that kind of keeps the battery from getting overcharged and having problems. And uh, I noticed the electronics are doing that. Like, in, I'm from Minnesota. You know, we kind of can get to minus 40 C. Yeah, same thing, actually. But anyways, you know, and I wonder what's going to happen if someone's using a battery backup situation. It seems like have you considered that there might be some colder environments that you're going to be in, and do they have to be put in a conditioned environment, like in their basements, like we have basements, or um, <laughs> or can they be put outside, and you know maybe there's some protections for that? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so we are actually designed to be installed indoors and outdoors. This is the benefit of a lot of the uh, tech, a lot of technology development we do at the car side of the business. People drive our cars in Norway, you know, in, in very cold climates and very hot climates. So um, one thing that we developed on the car side of the business is our, our batteries are, li uh, are liquid cooled. So it's a liquid cooled th uh, thermal management system. So when you talk about installing it outside, you can, just like solar panels, you want to install it in an optimal location. So if you could install it in an environment that has fairly regular temperature, that's not too hot or not too cold, you will get better performance. But we are designed to be to operate in those lower temperatures. And an, the one thing that is, is really good about the large thermal mass that we have in our system is, um, which is, you know, all the batteries in that pod, um, 
the, the liquid thermal system will take heat away and also bring heat. So we, we can actually heat up the cells. And when we, when we heat up or cool down the large thermal mass, the ambient temperature doesn't affect us as much and as quickly because of the large thermal mass, the actual cells will heat up and cool down slower than the ambient temperature. Uh, in addition, we do the thermal management. So even if it is very cold outside or very hot inside, we can operate more efficiently uh, than an air-cooled system. For Tesla and Enphase, um, are your systems for whole house backup or can they be configured to do just critical loads? Because if it's whole house, you're probably looking at a 10 minute backup. <laughs> um, so you can do both. So we are designed for backup. Uh, you know, most of the backup requests we've seen have been in the US. Uh, and most of the time people do do critical loads panel. Uh, but you can. Uh, you can potentially set it up to back up the whole house. Um, you're right, the energy that we have is um, 6.4 kilowatt hours or 9.2 kilowatt hours, depend, depending on which battery you have. Um, but you can increase that. So you can have multiple power walls. Uh, so in the future, we're designing to have increased kilowatt hours energy and increased kilowatts power um, so that you can, um, you, you can go into backup mode uh, for a much longer period of time. Uh, even at the whole house level. But it's all about sizing the system. And, and to answer your question about the Enphase product, to be clear, backup power is not a use case that we support. When we surveyed you know, residential consumers, you know, what we kept hearing over and over again was that you know, their expectation for a backup system is one that does provide whole home backup power, and not just for hours at a time, but for days. And, and really, we think the econ most economical solution is still a generator for that particular use case. So the beautiful thing about our system is that you don't have to pull circuits and, and wire up a critical load panel. Um, it just goes right into the, the main service panel with a 20 amp breaker. And um, the installation, you know, you can think about it in terms of minutes rather than hours for that reason. Hey, thanks. Um, it's kind of a common question, but uh, I just want to make an observation. I hope the rest of the industry supports me. Um, back in October, November, I think, Home Power Magazine had a lead editorial where they said, hey, we'd love to talk about the new battery technologies, but uh, we don't have a lot of information here. And if we look at the information that's being disclosed to us as design engineers and technical installers, there's a very steep curve that drops off going from left to right. And I would just, you know, I had customers calling me up and saying, hey, I bought the new Tesla battery. And... You know, I'm mumbling to myself, oh shit. Um, it was a gimmick that was disturbing because there was no information that said, you know, in advance, you know, no, this isn't battery for you or it's not gonna integrate with existing solar systems and things like that. So thank you for the two on the left for having good information, data that we can use because we're the product ex experts when it comes to interfacing with our customers. And I hope Tesla and Enphase, you can do a better job about getting the information to us so that when we're doing the design and integration, we can you know, correctly set expectations with our customers. Thanks. Thanks. You know, the great thing about our solution is that we've, you know, we've already done the optimization with the battery to the inverter. So we've taken that design complexity out of the equation. We use lithium iron phosphate batteries. Um, and it's, it's the safest and most stable chemistry that there is. In fact, you can hit it with a nail gun, puncture it with a nail gun, and no fireworks. <laughs> yeah. um, from a, a safety and design perspective, uh, you know, we've been intentionally a little bit secretive as we develop these things and test these things. Um, you know, I think there was some confusion in the market. Some people either thought or mistakenly were sold product. We've never approved any pre-sold product because we didn't want to set the wrong expectations. So a lot of people uh, were misinformed in the beginning, and we're trying to go out there and rectify that. Um, you know, we do, uh, we do work very closely with our partners, and I think uh, people from some of the installers here, including our hosts, can, under, uh, can, can verify that we're going to be in the field with them uh, doing first installs, supporting them in getting interconnections, supporting them in design process. Uh, we actually have uh, Kunal here with me, who's on the technical side, uh, and he's available for, for, uh, to discuss um, after this panel, some of the more technical requirements and, and support that we provide. So uh, we're very much trying to get ahead of that and learn lessons from the first installs. But as you know, 
Um, every jurisdiction is different. Some people are stuck in, um, in older ways of thinking, and we're still, we're still discussing with people you know, how we don't spill electrolyte if, if you know, there's a, an accident with, with one of our batteries. It, it just doesn't happen uh, in transport or uh, once it's installed. Our installation process is as easy as this. Take it out of the box, hang it on a cleat, two cables to the inverter, and you're done. I mean, how long can that really take, right? And we've seen it happen, and we're doing some training soon, and, and other people will see it happen. It's very simple uh, and an integrated system with our inverter partners. Uh, a quick one for all four of you. How many real-world installations are in place using each of the products that you're talking about? And how long has the oldest one been in? Uh, well, I'll just take it quickly because cause I, cause I have the mic. Uh, so we've actually been operating um, stationary storage products for quite some time at the utility scale, commercial, and, and residential. Uh, all in, we have about 95 megawatt hours of product in the ground operating today. Uh, so we have, and that includes Powerwall and Powerpack. Uh, so we have quite a bit of experience of operating the systems ourselves and working through channel partners to, uh, to install and operate and maintain systems. And how old is the oldest? Four years. Yeah. So the AC battery is a new product for Enphase. Um, but what we do have is it uses the S270 microinverter and the Envoy S gateway. So those um, devices are out there being sold and installed today in the field. Um, the only difference is that, you know, instead of connecting the, the microinverter to a PV module, we're connecting it to a battery. And so we think that that's one reason we, it's going to be a lot easier for AHJs to understand our solution, because chances are they're familiar with Enphase. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we've been uh, commercially operational. We've been selling commercially for the last two years. Um, so our um, so last year uh, we did 15 megawatt hours, and the, pri the year prior to that uh, was six megawatt hours. Um, and those are operational because majority of our business is uh, behind the meter, um, or commercial or residential. Um, we also have a couple of units that are three, four years old. Uh, those were the prototypes before we went commercial. So we started shipping in the fourth quarter, so several hundred uh, batteries uh, in terms of what we've shipped so far. Um, don't know exactly how many of those have been installed, um, and but we've been you know testing this technology for four years, and it's based upon AGM technology. It's a different chemistry in terms of where it is. So the install should go and safe. You know all the economics and all that are are well known and well defined. All right, we got time for one more question. Um, I understand how. Um, an Aquian battery or a lead acid battery is scalable. I'm not quite so sure understanding how the Tesla Powerwall or the AC battery would be scalable. Can you kind of quickly address if I wanted to add more than one Powerwall or several um, Enphase batteries, how that would work? Sure. So just like the microinverter connects, you know, on a branch circuit down to the main service panel, in our case, you can connect 13 AC batteries on a single 20 amp branch circuit. Put a mounting bracket in, hang it. It's really fast. Yeah. Um, there's only so much detail I can go into in a public forum, but I can say that we are doing multiple power walls. They will be daisy chained together. There will be a certain limit to how many power walls that you can daisy chain together. Um, but the idea with us is, you know, we're really focused on residential and commercial and utility scale. So as you're able to, as we're increasing energy and power in the power wall. We're increasing the number of power walls that you can daisy chain. And we're also decreasing the footprint on the power pack side. We're going to have a very small gap where you can't find the right solution for that application uh, in, in kilowatt hours and kilowatts. Cool. That was really quick. So we actually have time for one more who's got a really good short question. All right. All right. Just a quick question, primarily for Tesla and Enphase. When can we see your product? When can we buy it? Uh, sure. Well, I'm happy to announce we've had uh, first product shipping in December. Um, we are doing uh, initial testing with customers and starting to sell in January with, uh, with our partners. So uh, we do have a um, more of a controlled channel. So we're very selective in who uh, we're selling product to and also who installs the product. Uh, that's both on, we want to make sure people have the expertise 
Uh, they're reliable, they're, they're financially stable, they're, they have high quality installs, um, great support from our, our buyers and our distributors. Um, but you will see those installations coming, um, being installed January, February, March, and ramping up throughout the year. And for Enphase, the AC battery and the AC battery platform, um, this is going to be available later this year, first in Australia, because there's a huge need and demand for, for storage down there with the, the feed-in tariff regulations. But followed shortly after uh, that is Hawaii. We'll be in the market there later this year. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, around for our, uh, our brave panelists. <laughs>